Jesus 
everybody, it's Ben Fielding from Hillsign. I just want to thank you for watching this video. You are on our YouTube channel and you can subscribe to it on this link right down here. is my Savior's blood Your beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame The image of love upon death's frame If having my heart was worth Joy could you see beyond the grave If love found my soul were dying for How wonderful, how glorious My Savior's God, Victor
Good morning. We are asking the funeral directors to bring the body forward. Let's stand as the body is coming forward. It has been brought forward. Let's stand in respect. of the deceased Peter, which I'm a relative, and all who have come, friends, and other relationships to pay respects. We welcome to church today on behalf of the modern of the church, on behalf of the board, on behalf of the pastor. Next to me is our first elder, Bernard, and on the piano is our pastor, Pastor Philbert. They have all consented to be here today because we want to celebrate with you the life and favor from God of Peter. We welcome you. Hope you have a wonderful experience with us in spite of the fact that you are and pray that at the end of this experience, we all would be more decided in our minds to serve God, follow Jesus, and be in the kingdom. Soon come in kingdom. So let us stand for prayer as we pray. Father, this morning, in the name of Jesus, we have come here. Your Holy Spirit has reminded us and has brought us here so that, Lord, we can fellowship with those who are grieving. We have come here, O oh God, because it's what we ought to do if we say we love Jesus, we ought to show love for our fellow human beings. Father, we tell that we have known our brother for so long that you have given him to us. We thank you, Lord, that his experience with us would have been beneficial, not have been always beneficial. We thank you, O oh God, that you are there, always with us, always with us. You have blessed us, provided for us, and you have prepared a redemption package through Jesus. And today, Lord, we thank you that we all are cognizant of redemption and salvation to Jesus and have come to worship you as we celebrate the life of our deceased brother. In Jesus' name, we say all these things. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. And we go to our song sheets. And at the hymn, How Great Thou Art. Now I know that Peter's relatives from Tobago, from Tobago for, the for the most part, part and, um, and um, most, most of the Tobago, Tobago people are uh, uh, either Methodist, Methodist, Adventist, or otherwise. So this is a familiar of great God.
Our scripture reading this morning from two texts from Job. First one, Job 14.14. 14. I read from the New King James Version. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait till my change comes. Second excerpt from the Bible, the book of Job, is from Job 19 and from verse 25 to 27. It reads, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall be whole, and not another. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. All right. We have another hymn, number 499. It is on our pamphlet here. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear
trials and temptation? Have we trials and temptation? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so the life of Brother Peter Allen or eulogy. Well, good morning, Brother. I was told that um, no one wanted to read the eulogy. You know, if someone, sometimes in these occasions we get a little bit cold feet. But nonetheless, I'm a bona fide relative, so I can read it just the same. And I want to say that before I read the eulogy, I want to offer condolences on behalf of the Mondo Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm offering condolences to Peter's relatives, his sons and wife and relatives who are here, and I'm offering the, the condolences on behalf of the church, on behalf of the church board, on behalf of our pastor. Peter, Peter was an active part of the Monroe Seventh-day Adventist Church when we all were young men. He's now 71 years old, and um, he was an EY leader at one time. He was active in evangelism, liked to laugh, liked to eat, and locally, as we say, liked to lime. So um, we have a spot in our heart for him. So as we offer condolences on behalf of the Mondo Church, we offer it with the knowledge, as I keep saying, that Jesus is coming again, and we all can be ready that when Jesus comes, we will see Peter again. On behalf of the Mondo Seventh-day Adventist Church, we are offering condolences to the relatives and friends of Peter, now deceased, Aline. Now, is there anyone else you would like to? Or I will read the, the eulogy, and anyone who would like to say something after or even before can indicate to indicate. There's a mic over here. And um, you can see, come and see, stand and see what Peter um, meant to you. But let me read while you, 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 you gain your feet. And so Peter Vincent Allen. Now, I didn't know his name was Vincent. Eh? Because if I knew his name was Vincent, he would have been in for a lot of heckle when we were younger. But his name is Peter Vincent Allen, 71 years old. He was born on August 9th, 1951 in Port of Spain, Trinidad. His mother was Yunel Aline. She was a native of Charlottesville, Tobago, and part of the large Aline family. Well, if you know Tobago good and you know Charlottesville, Charlottesville 
is Aline, Aline Tom. Right? Anyone who knows to be shallow. His mother, you know. In his early years, he lived in the eyes of in the hills of Lavantil, near the famous Desperado Steel Band Camp. And he attended Gonzalez Government Elementary School. He did not learn to play pan as the other men in the area, young men, since his mother, Yunel, did not allow it. The family eventually moved to Pitybook. Now, there was a stigma in those days for young men who associated themselves with pan, although pan was popular, but there was a stigma, and Yunel was quite serious. She didn't want Peter to play no pan because she didn't want him to be no bajon. You know when you play pan long ago? You should say that you're a bajon, you'd go up to be a bajon and whatever, right? He never learned to play pan, but he was a good fighter, you couldn't push him over, right? Peter had a passion for education. After attending Emmanuel High School, that's in Bataria, I went there too, he went to Caribbean Union College, now University of the Southern Caribbean, where he began his studies in theology. He migrated to USA intending to complete his studies in theology at Oakwood College University. We know that's the Adventist University in the southern part of the US, I suppose. While working in New York, New York as a taxi driver to earn money for college, he canceled his plans for Oakwood and opted for City University of New York. He attended John Jay College and then Brooklyn College for graduate studies. For in the daytime, he worked, sorry, studies in the daytime, sorry and he worked at night to support his studies. He, as most people do when they migrate, they do studies and job at the same time. Peter was able to communicate very good, very versatile, and his excellent interpersonal skills and his drive to see young people become educated and productive all led to his choice of career. First, he worked as a social worker assistant case manager for City of New York, helping vulnerable families obtain services necessary to improve their lives and meet established goals. So he worked as a social worker assistant case, that is SWACM SWAM, right? To improve their lives, lovely. Because he liked to help young people. From 1992, while doing graduate studies in reading towards a master's in education, he started his journey as a reading teacher with the city of New York, conducting remedial classes for high school students to develop comprehensive skills to an acceptable standard. He was really into young people. His teaching skills and passion for service led him to volunteer at the Rogers Avenue Seventh-day Adventist Community Service, Rogers Avenue, Seventh-day Adventist Church, Community Service Department, Brooklyn, New York, where he was a member of that church, Rogers Avenue, SDA, Brooklyn. He taught GED classes in reading, science, and social studies to youths, to youths and adults, some of whom went on to schools of higher learning. He did this from 1996 to about 2015 without monetary compensation. It's quite recent. He was that type of person. Peter led an active church life. He was a member of Mondo SDA Church, where he served as AY leader before migrating. I mentioned that. He was a member also of the Rogers Avenue SDA Church, where he served in various capacities, including men's ministry. Peter was also a member and officer of the New York chapter of the University of the Southern Caribbean Alumni Association up to the time of his leaving the USA. He, Peter was consistently engaged in the culture and politics of Trinidad and Tobago, listening to the Trinidad news, loving Calypso and Pan, attending some cultural events in New York. No, that, that doesn't mean he was a jump up man, he wasn't that but he loved his native Calypso and Pan. He wrote poems, compositions, Calypso, and he wrote anecdotes for himself and for anyone who requested or I guess who listened. 
and for any occasion, right? However, Peter's greatest passion, amazing of all, was cooking. For many occasions at Church Visitors Day, Banquet Mother's Day, even CUC Alumni Day, Peter was the cook. With the help of his two friends, Pops and Flatter, some of us might know them, right? He used to put down a rice and peas, nice tasting food, and always on, the, on demand. But he did not like to have women in the kitchen. They always did something he said to spoil the taste. When he was in the kitchen, he wanted to be there. Peter spent about two months in recent, his recent life. Peter spent about two months in the hospital, after which he was no longer able to live or to be cared for at home. He spent the last two months at the Asarion Senior Citizens Home, where he was well cared for. However, his failing heart was no longer able to sustain him. He leaves to mourn his wife, Teleka, his sons, Richard and Jerome, they are here with us today, their mom, Gloria, his brother, Winston, sister-in-laws, Bridget and daughter-in-law, Zamara, and five grandchildren, Xavier, Maria, Juliet, Rachel, and Randall. His auntie, Inez, she's here, Inez is here, his brother, Winston, is here. Um, his cousins, Joan, Raymond, and many others of the Aline, Moore, and Thomas's families, those were the Link families. His friends and church family are many here and abroad. This is the tribute from his sons and close ones paid the tribute. This was a, a, a character of the man Peter Aline, whose death we are now celebrating in the name of Jesus. Does anyone have any tribute they'd like to say, do, think to our brother Peter today? Friend, relative, whatever. Now is the time, it's better. Um, could I have a mic? Hi, can you come across? Hi, good morning. This is a tribute from Lloyd Chapman, better known as Flatter, a friend of Uncle Peter for many years. It is often said that the world is a stage and human beings are merely players. We have our entrances and our exits, and one man can play many parts in this time. Many things he may be able to do to become a better man. It is also said that to be a man requires that you accept everything life has to give, beginning with your name. It is therefore a well-known fact that the name Peter means a rock or a stone, a label given to Simon Bar Jonah by Jesus himself. During my time working with Peter, for the New York chapter of the Alumni Association, Peter was able to reflect the element of a rock. On many occasions, it was upon his shoulders the success of this celebration rested. The organization depended heavily upon him for the preparation of the meals, and on most instances, he did what was expected of him. It must be noted, too, that to survive in the USA, Peter played many roles. He was a teacher, a painter, a culinary artist, a tax preparer, and also involved in other pursuits. This apparent diligent passion for work was a firm indication that Peter was not only bent on success, but wanted to endure a suitable livelihood and to play his part in the betterment of the community. It was indeed a sad day when he announced that he will be returning to Trinidad to reside. He did not know at that time it was good bad. We are now very heartbroken by his abrupt departure from this world. Therefore, on behalf of the NY Alumni USC chapter, 
We just want to offer our condolences to his friends and family. We also like to say goodbye to our friend and brother. Your earthly exile is now over. Alas, down to death's dusty descent, and to God return the breath that he lent. Nay, no more to toil and be weary, nor to be weighed with anguish and worry. This sinful land, so desolate and dark, the ever-present conflicts often left their mark. Ah, but you live too, at times you complained, yeah, when overwhelmed with sorrow and pain, but Jesus watched you day after day. Then enough, he said, and called you away. This world, a wilderness of trouble and woe, sin held you captive with trials and sorrow. But this sinful world will soon pass over. We look for the new Jerusalem beyond. So goodbye, friend. Undisturbed, you must sleep just for a season. Soon to be roused by Gabriel from your moldy prison. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Gordon St. Hilaire. My name is Gordon St. Hilaire, and I stand uh, express condolences to the friends and relatives of, of uh, Brother Allen. I must confess that the eulogy I've listened to, that we have listened to, have said everything that I had in mind to say about the Quran. I have never heard a more comprehensive I have never heard a more comprehensive eulogy and you did a fine job. Thank you. However, I'd just like to emphasize two aspects that were mentioned before. Save me for repeating. I didn't know Peter at school. I, I was the business manager of the Caribbean Union College for a number of years, even while he attended. But being a day student and maybe having all the money that he needed to go to school, he hardly had to interact with me. However, we met in New York at the Rogers Avenue Church. Peter, as you mentioned, that GED class was all of Peter's. And so much so that when he left, or when he stopped taking care of the classes, the class died. In addition to that, most of the people or the students that he dealt with in the class were not Adventists. And he has been a great help to the community in New York from the aspect of the GD class of the Rogers Avenue Church. The coping that he spoke about, he has always loved cooking, and uh, we always enjoyed his cooking. There was a slight rivalry sometimes between him and some other want to be cooks in the, in the alumni association. But he took this in good stead and in good graces, a good grace, and we had a fun time while we were together. I think Peter will be sorely missed, and I again just want to express my sadness and condolences on my behalf and behalf of the Rogers Avenue Church and the CUC Alumni Association. Okay, thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other tributes? Okay. Very smiling at me, no boy. Okay, no more well, we move on with the program. We move on with the program. We would sing hymn number 108, Amazing Grace, a well-known hymn. We'll stand and sing, and while we are singing this, an offering will be taken up for church expenditures. I say church expenditures because it costs us to be out today and to have personnel out so that 
you know, the church will be blessed by your generous offerings. So let us stand as we sing Amazing Grace. Him. Grace again? Oh, sorry. Pastor would not take the restroom. did not know our friend and brother, Peter Vincent Allen, but I know a little of Brother Allen, uh, and um, he's one of our elders, and he shared with me uh, the experience of Vincent, Peter, and so I have no doubt that our God who is faithful and has promised that he will do justly by our dear brother. And so I want to extend to the immediate family 
my own condolences. I know that, and you know that relationships this side of Eden are not permanent. Sooner or later there is separation. And whenever there is separation, there is a sense of loss. Whenever there is loss, there is grief. And so today I know you are grieving. And while we all grieve in different ways, uh, we simply cannot really get into the feelings of others and to know how death impacts them. And so, please accept my condolences and I can only pray that God's comfort would attend you and even this too for you shall pass. There's a passage of scripture that I want to use as I share what I see as words of comfort. <coughs> it's found in First Thessalonians chapter 5. Well, chapter 4, actually. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want to read from verse 13. Apostle Paul, in writing to the Thessalonians, said at this point, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise the first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we have a brief word of prayer. Eternal God, we pray that as we reflect on your words that you would indeed speak to every heart. You are the God of all comfort. And I pray that we would all have a keen sense of your presence with us this morning. And pray that you would bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this morning I just want to Not, I have no script as such. I just want to talk with you briefly on belief. It might seem like a strange topic on an occasion like this, but we are told by the psychologists that there is no action apart from belief. What we believe about a thing determines how we relate to that thing. And all our actions, what I believe is good for my body, that's what I eat. And even if I don't know that it, if, even if I know it's not good for my body, then I still know that it's not good even if I eat. But all our actions stem from what we believe about things. Sometimes we don't even know what we believe. But when we are placed in certain circumstances, then we behave. And that ought to tell us really what we believe about the thing. It's one thing to say, I believe in God. But when I find myself in certain circumstances, then I begin to question this whole idea about God. <laughs> Is it just, you know, I mean, why did this have to happen to me if God exists and if he is a God of love and all that type of thing. You know, they, they, it was Guatama Buddha. Of 
course, we, I don't know what your belief system is, but I don't think we have any Buddhists among us. But um, Gautama Buddha said, there are four facts of life. Old age, sickness, poverty, and death. Regardless of what your belief is, I don't think we could argue with the Buddha on this occasion because if we live long enough, then we get old. Not so? Sickness is all around us and we, from time to time, get ill as well. Poverty we cannot deny. The larger population of the world lives in poverty. You know, even in our own country, the unions speak about <laughs> the one percent or the two percent and all that type of stuff. Poverty. But of course, death is no respecter of persons, regardless of our age, regardless of our, our orientation in terms of our culture, in terms of our race, if you want to call it that. Sooner or later, the Bible says it clearly, the living know that they shall die. It is the dead that doesn't know anything. So, in a real sense, religion, which many people don't like to hear about, is really one's posture in the face of death's inevitability. What I believe about the future and the reality of my death is going to determine how I choose to live my life. And how I live is really my religion. Whether I decide to go with some denomination, I'll organize something, or if I just say, you know, this is just my beliefs, and this is what I live by. Belief is so important in the Bible. We see belief as the underlying thread that runs through all scripture. In fact, all of us might know that text quite well, found in John chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how important belief is, because we cannot have salvation except we believe. <laughs> and believe in the Christ. In fact, the text doesn't end there, the, the, the thought that is, and maybe we should just uh, quickly, uh, it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. John chapter three, and verse 17 and following. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. The world is already condemned. Christ came on a salvation or a rescue mission. Verse 18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, verse 19, that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so it's clear that this word belief is very important because it has salvific consequences. But the belief I want to speak about, no, it's not different when I say but. I meant the angle to which I want to take this is that we all have beliefs that guide us. But you would appreciate that if belief is so important it has to do with, with salvation itself, then you would, you would agree with me that we ought to examine our beliefs. <laughs> we ought to be careful about what we believe. We can't simply believe everything we hear, regardless of its source. Some people believe everything they read in the newspaper. Some people believe everything they hear a preacher say. Some people believe everything they 
they were taught since they were growing up. And they decided, I'm never going to change. This is what my parents believe. This is what I believe. And, you know, seldom do we stop as human beings to evaluate our own beliefs. But when it comes to old age, sickness, poverty, and death, not only is our beliefs challenged, but sometimes we are so emotionally distraught that it doesn't even make sense what we, the questions we ask, because that's when we have a lot of questions. I remember Jesus walking with his disciples one day, and they met a man who was born blind, and he was sitting by the road, and they asked Jesus, uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Of course, if you think about it, how could this man sin before he was born in order to... It doesn't make sense. But that's what happens when we are confronted with sickness and death. We have many questions to which there are no answers, it appears. And therefore, our belief systems are what kicks in. And what we believe about the thing is going to determine how we behave. I have seen in my 40 or years in this ministry, as I bury folks, I have seen people lying on the coffin and they don't want to let go. I've seen some wanting to dive in the hole. You have to restrain them. I've seen all kinds of stuff. And it's all because of beliefs impacting on them. I didn't get to say goodbye. I wonder what the consequences might be for that. Uh, uh, they have no hope for tomorrow. So it's not as if they're looking forward to see this person in the future. In their belief, this is the end. This is it. And all of that impacts. I don't know where you are in terms of your own personal emotional frame at this point. I just know that you're grieving. And the answers to your questions might, all, might not always make sense. Or even the questions themselves. But the Bible is basically about belief. So much so that in the book of John, as John was coming to the end of writing his, uh, excuse me, as he was coming to the end of writing, I think it's in John chapter, chapter 20. Yes, there are 21 chapters and in chapter 20 as he's, He's winding down, as it were. He says, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. He's saying there are a lot of things I could have written because Christ did so much. I didn't write them here. He says, But these are written that you may believe. So he, he's making it clear. <laughs> there are many things I could have written and so on, but I wrote some stuff here, but... The reason I wrote this is that you might believe. Believe what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the only important thing on the planet right now. We have a way we live our lives. We follow others, what they pursue, and we want to have a good house. We want to drive a good car, we want to live in a nice neighborhood, we want our children to go to college, we want, and, and we follow this pattern, but, but we never stop to think, is this all to life? This round of activities that seem to lead nowhere, what about the future? Is there really a future beyond death? And am I preparing for that future, if I believe? What are your beliefs? At a time like this, I don't want you to be thinking too much. The mind isn't prepared for too much cognitive activity. We just want to grieve. We want to mourn. But sometimes, this is the only time we are sober enough to pause and to think about ourselves. 
in the face of death. So, we just read a passage, and you would have observed in First, Corinthians, in First Thessalonians chapter four. The apostle ends by saying, therefore, comfort one another with these words. So somewhere between, I do not want you to be ignorant and comfort one another, he's gonna say some things that ought to bring comfort on an occasion like this. And so I will briefly highlight some of the things that I believe he wanted us to take comfort in. <coughs> Excuse me. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. You see, the, you remember that the only Bible that the disciples and Christ would have had was what we call the Old Testament. So they knew that the dead knows not anything. It's in the Bible. They know that it is, you know, dust of the ground and the breath of life that God gives is what equals a living soul. And so when this breath goes back to God, who owns it, so to speak, then all we have is dust. They, they are familiar with Genesis. They are familiar with the Old Testament. Uh, but you see, and even though they knew that Christ had raised people from the dead and, you know, Isaiah in the past and so on, they, they didn't know about the future <laughs> because revelation is progressive. God didn't just send everything down. No, he had what we call apostles and, you know, he, he had um, prophets and others and he would speak to them, to us. So they didn't have this information. So Paul is saying, because of their concern. Crisis coming soon is the message that they were carrying because he did promise to come again. However, uncle was dying. And uncles and aunts and, and relatives and close ones were dying and they, they were saying, but if Christ had come, then what would happen to them? Because they are in the graves um, and they had concerns. So the apostle is writing to this, and that's why I say it's on an occasion like this, that he would have highlighted this, and let's see what he's saying. He's saying, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So two things I'm seeing here. I'm seeing that he's describing death as a sleep. And then he's suggesting that it is only people who do not have hope that is going to sorrow in a way that is really a little detrimental to their own health and being. Because human beings need hope. People only believe what they hope is true, is what the psychologists tell us. And that's why it's so easy for us to believe certain things that certain people say, because we actually hope that that is true. But God doesn't want us to be in doubt, and so through Paul, he's saying, I'm not, I don't want you to be ignorant. It's important that you have information. It's important that you know certain things, otherwise you run away with your own ideas, and that might put you in a place where it's deleterious to your health. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. Where did he get this idea about death as a sleep. He got it from Christ himself. The apostles uh, would recall that a close friend of Christ died, Lazarus by name. In fact, the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. Yet, there was this one family, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, who, who accommodated the Christ from time to time as he came to town. So they were close. And so they sent word to Jesus that he whom thou lovest is sick. 
sickness comes to every home. And of course, if you're a friend of Christ, then that's the first person you'd call. But they found Jesus daily dallying somehow, as we say in China. In other places, he would say, okay, I'll come and heal. But here is Lazarus, a friend, and they couldn't understand it. But Christ knew what he was going to do. So he allowed four days to pass. When he told his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. In fact, one of them said, well, if he's sleeping, he does well because with all his stress and so on, if he's ill, and then he needs the rest. But the Bible says, he told them plainly afterwards, Lazarus is dead. So he was the one using this euphemism, if you want to call it that. that Lazarus is asleep. But Jesus is always teaching. So when he says that, it's because he wants them to understand that this death, this first death, is nothing but a sleep. You see, when you go to sleep, you don't say, I'm not going, you anticipate that you're going to rise the next day. Whether you say your prayers or not, you go to sleep with plans for tomorrow. And so, the Bible teaches that the truth is, there's a time coming when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. But some to everlasting life, to others everlasting condemnation. There's going to be this two resurrection is what he's saying. And we won't all come up in the same resurrection. But we will come up. Whether in the first or in the second. Therefore this is but like a sleep. I fall asleep today in death. And when I open my eyes, my eyes, I'm going to see Christ. Or I'm going to see something else. So it's in that sense it's a sleep. So I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those which are asleep. And that's the first thing that would hit the disciples. Oh, this is just a sleep. <laughs> it's like saying, take comfort in this reality. I don't want you to sorrow as others which have no hope. The, in Scripture, the blessed hope in Scripture is the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christians look forward to Jesus Christ's coming because he has promised when he comes, he will make all things new. And there'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, for the former things would have passed away. And therefore, this is the blessed hope of the Christian. I know some people teach that, you know, we, we die and we go to heaven or we go to hell or we go to some place, but that's not even in the, in the Bible. And that's why it's important that you evaluate your own beliefs because it gives a false hope. But you want, it's only the truth that will set you free, the Bible says. And so um, what the Bible really teaches is what Paul is going to talk about here. But before we get ahead of ourselves, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that, yeah, well, if, if when I die, I go to heaven, then that would be the blessed hope, right? Death. <laughs> will be the blessed hope. But, but the blessed hope for the Christian is the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what is Paul saying? Uh, Paul says, for you yourselves, no, I'm in the wrong place. All right, verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, we're not going before them. So we don't have an auntie somewhere up in heaven and so on. And our brother here is going to meet her eventually and all that type of stuff. In fact, he might already be with her in the thinking of some. Now the Bible is saying, the dead know not anything. The dead is dead and the dead is in the grave. But at the coming of the Lord, we who are alive will not go before. In other words, we're not leaving them in the grave. That's what he's saying. He says, take comfort in this. They want information. They want to know about their loved ones. And he's saying, we're not going to leave them. 
when Christ comes. But then what is going to happen, Paul? Well, let's continue to read. For this we say, verse 15, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede or go before those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. He's explaining how this thing is going to work now. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So let's see if we get this now. He wants to comfort the saints. They are concerned about their loved ones who have died. They don't know what's going to happen. They think that when Christ comes, they will go with Christ and leave the others behind. Paul is saying, no, listen, let me tell you how it's going to happen. And I'm telling you this based on the word of the Lord, he says. He's saying, when Christ comes, there's going to be a lot of noise. It's not going to be some secret rapture. No trumpets with blasts and so on. Uh, every eye shall see him, the Bible says elsewhere. He says, but, but understand this. The dead in Christ, those who have died believing in this Christ, that same belief that we have spoken about that if we believe in the Son, then, you know, we have life. If we believe not, then that same belief that we started talking about. He's saying, if you are among those who believed in Christ and you fall asleep or you die, he says, you will rise first when Christ comes. So assuming that Christ should come even while we are speaking here, and this was a burial ground long before the church was even here, <laughs> then we would just see, you know, this floor start, um, some kind of earthquake, something happening, and the floor is opening up, and we're seeing folks coming up from the grave. Oh, yes. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, who are alive, but, but we have to qualify this we. It has to be, if it is the dead in Christ, it has to be we who are in Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah, because he's speaking to Christian people who believe. He says, then we that are alive and remain, we shall be caught up together with them. So everybody's going at the same time, is what he's saying. So I hear, I hear him saying, take comfort in this. We shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord isn't coming to land on this earth and somebody have to tell you he's in New York and they just saw him in Australia and, and all that type of stuff. When he comes, every eye shall see him, but he's not going to land here. We shall be caught up to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. He says, comfort one another with these words. Well, it would have been very comforting to the Christians who believe. I don't know how you feel at this point, but a lot depends on what your own personal relationship is with Christ. And so I can only encourage you to get to know him if you feel you don't know him. To examine your beliefs based on scripture and not the philosophies of men. Because it is so important, it has to do even with your salvation. Our dear brother can no longer choose. He is dead. We can only hope that he would have chosen to allow Christ a place in his life so that he would have died believing. If that is the case, he will be rising even before we begin to rise. Because as he is rising, we too who are alive and remain, will be caught up to meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another.
with these words. May God bless us. Okay, we, we want to have a prayer of comfort at this time. And so I'll invite the family members who are here to come a little closer to the uh, coffin here as we, we have this prayer of comfort. All right? Yeah, well. Shall we, shall we pray? O oh, great eternal God, you who can read the hearts of all men, you who in all points were tempted like as we are, yet without sin, you no frame. You remember that we are dust. You do not treat us as we deserve. You are merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. It is to you that we come, Lord, at this time, because we know that you are acquainted with our infirmities, acquainted with our grief. And it is not your will that any should perish, but that all of us would come to repentance. Death is the result of sin. And Jesus Christ came to deal with sin. We are so thankful, Lord, for him and for the love that he has manifested toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You are not asking us to make ourselves good and then come. No, you want us to come that you might make us what you want us to be. And so I pray, Lord, that you would be with this family, this extended family here. Their loved one has passed on, and they are grieving. But this is a good time to remind ourselves of why death in the first place, and why Jesus Christ came. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we pray, Lord, that each one here, and even others who have come for support, that you would Help all of us to, as we have been advised, teach us to number our days. That we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. We know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. May all of us come to know you. May all of us come to, 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 to experience you in our lives. And the transformation that results as your spirit takes hold of us and begin to make us more and more like Christ. Help us, Lord, to live in hope. And I pray that as we go through the next few weeks, when the reality of this separation would grip some of us even more than it has already, I pray that they would remember that you're with them, and by your grace, they can overcome. They can circumvent, they can undergo it, they can go through this experience successfully and come out on the other side giving you thanks and praise for who you are and for your great love toward us. Bless them, Lord. Cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious unto them. Lift up the light of your countenance upon them and give them peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we pray it and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. Amen. You may go back to your seats. Return to your seats. We have our closing 
Tässä. Our closing, our closing song, hymn number 647, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory. It is in your... This song and put it in the center of the Okay. We'll stand up in it. All right, she will stand for the closing song. My eyes have seen the glory. Number 647. Let's stand. Mine I have seen the glory of the coming up. He is trampling out the vintage where the frips of what he has. Faithful lightning is truth is marching on. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is. He has sounded for the trump that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgments. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him, be jubilant. God is marching. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lead, Christ was born. With a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. Oh, God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. Amen. Shall we bow our heads for the benediction and then... Uh, you want to do the vote of thanks first? All right, okay. Okay, I'm not here to tell another story. Um, I'm Telica, Peter's wife, and I'm just here to say thank you. Um, he has a cousin in uh, New York who sent me a video and I couldn't get to play it. I'm sorry I didn't get to play it, but Joan, if you're listening in, I just want to thank you for the role that you played in Peter's life while in the States, whenever he got sick, if I needed someone to stay at home with him, she did. And she played a really good role. She loved Peter and he loved her. And so I also want to thank um, Frank Bissoon, who is his landlord, and his family. They, uh, he wasn't just a landlord, he looked out for Peter. He'll go down in the morning, look for him, when he's not feeling well, he helped him to the hospital and stuff like that. So I want to thank uh, Mr. Bissoon, Maggie and Clovis John. They would call him, look for him, carry meals sometimes. You know, he likes his food. So, And I just want to thank Mount Hope Hospital and the Coover Hospital and Cora Hospital. Um, especially Cora Hospital, they called every day, giving updates while he was there. And I just want to thank them for their commitment to excellence in patient care and for good patient satisfaction. Then uh, I also want to thank Anne-Marie Phillips Holder and her staff at Assyrian 
senior citizen's home. He was there for two months and they provided excellent care. Um, they came highly recommended and um, they really did live, live up to the name. And they were patient and steadfast. When Mr. Allen wanted to be stubborn and do what he wanted to do, they were steadfast and did the right thing. And uh, they were patient and they were caring. And I really want to thank them. And if anyone is looking for a senior citizen home, a Syrian, I come highly recommended. And uh, for you who are here, those who are listening online, all his friends and family, Auntie Inez and Raymond and Uncle uh, Mo. I want to thank all of you for the support. When I couldn't be there, you all were there. Those who made phone calls, those who sent messages, I just thank you very much for all the support, the love, and the prayers. And Monk Door Church and Brother Emmanuel, have, first time I've seen him in person, but I know his voice, and I want to thank him for all that he has done to get this service put together. He was chief cook and bottle washer, and I thank him very much. And now this is done. He's gone to rest. And we have to carry on. So I pray that God bless us all. Let's keep looking up to Jesus. Because the day is coming when he will come again. And he's now the author and finisher of our faith. So let's carry on and live for him. Thank you so much. And now we stand for the benediction. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you that you are creator. And now we understand your are our redeem, Redeemer. We thank you, dear Lord, that you are the one who is coming back. And we all, including Peter, if he is faithful, he will take us, or take us all to heaven with you. And we comfort each other with these words. And now as we go to in turn in we pray, dear Lord, that you will be with those of us who are left here, continuing the journey. I pray that your spirit walk with us, to comfort us, to give us peace. And I pray, dear Lord, that our walk, our continued walk, will be steadfast. You lead in the way, and we follow in what you direct us to do. We thank you and we praise you. May you bind the family together closer to each other as they support each other through this situation of death. Thank you and we praise you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, two uh, full announcements that I would like to make. We will want to open the casket so that those who didn't get an opportunity will be able to get an opportunity. So the directors, the funeral directors will do that. Also, I was asked to um, let you know that there's uh, a repast or refreshments at the back. You will use this entrance. You can go to the back where there will be some refreshments set up so that you could also partake. And not too long because we have to do the internment also at San Juan Cemetery. All right, so those who uh, want to view the body can come up and they can exit on my right so we can get to the back so that we can have our refreshments and quickly head to San Juan Cemetery. Thank you.
Yeah. 